Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. Welcome to tonight's installment of Screen Times, which presents exclusive screenings of the most anticipated new movies, followed by conversations with top film talent. I want to give special thanks to the presenting sponsor of Screen Times, HBO, and share the following preview of coming attractions. Our history of racial inequality in America casts a shadow over the modern death penalty. We set up this project to provide legal services to people on death row. Brian is the work. There's no way to separate him. Tonight, we are taking this broken history, and we're trying to do something with it. It's important to understand all the ugly details so we can one day claim something really beautiful. And now, please join me in welcoming New York Times culture reporter Milena Rizek and our special guests, the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, and the stars of Just Mercy, Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I am so excited to be here with this incredible collection of artists, thinkers, and writers to talk about this film and their work. So let's jump, just jump right in. Did you guys like the movie? Yeah. So Brian, I'm going to start with you. The, the rights to your book were sold even before publication, but I'm wondering, did you feel any trepidation about dramatizing these stories and your own story as well? Oh, I did. I mean, too often uh, when books become films, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they lose something, and I didn't want to lose uh, the voices uh, that I was writing about. I, you know, I feel committed to the clients that I represent, and their stories haven't generally been told. So I was nervous about someone doing something to compromise the truth of what we're trying to do. Um, but when uh, Michael got involved uh, and I spent some time with him, I began to have confidence that we might be able to do this because not only is he an extraordinarily gifted actor and an incredibly talented human being, he also cares deeply about these issues. And uh, he was uh, prepared to make the choices that are not always easy and comfortable, but are necessary if you're gonna talk about an issue like this. And Destin, the director, had that same orientation. And spending time with them gave me the hope that we, that we might be able to do this. And what's been so exciting for me is to see the film and to see the quality of the performances. Jamie's performance as Walter McMillan is just so extraordinary. Uh, And um, he, he brings the humanity and the dignity of Walter McMillan to life, and Rob Morgan's performance as Herbert Richardson, and Tim's, and Karen Kendricks. All of them do this thing that allow you to see the kind of people that I've been working with my entire career. And I can't say enough about Michael's performance. I was so moved. You know, I, I, I believe you have to be strategic and tactical. You have to be persuasive when you're trying to change the world. You can't just stand up and shout things and demand things. You have to go where people are. And Michael embraced that approach in the performance. And it was so um, humbling to see someone so talented uh, putting their all into this. So it, it was nervous for me at the beginning. I was very apprehensive. Uh, but when I saw the film, I was really moved by it and even more excited but the people I stand with, I go into jails and prisons, I stand with the poor and the accused and the condemned, people who've been marginalized, people who've been forgotten. And a lot of times they begin to fear that the whole world is forgotten about them, that their voices will never be heard. And if nothing else, when this film gets out, 
there will be an opportunity to hear the voices of the condemned and the excluded, the condemned, uh, the accused, and the uh, abused and the mistreated in our system. And that makes me really, really, really hopeful, really excited, because I think it's an important thing we need to have in this country if we're going to deal honestly with these issues. So you mentioned the director in, the, in his notes about the film. He talks about you seeing the moment where you kind of become this hero. Now, Michael, you have a little bit of experience with the superhero genre, <laughs> um, as does Brie Larson, your co-star. Is there some way that you differentiated Brian from a superhero, or no? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, no, I mean, I, th I think he is our, our superhero. He is this generation's superhero. He, um, the way, the way I, when I first met him, I, I was, I was intimidated, you know, I, I don't really, you know, I don't get starstruck like that. I kind of grew up in the industry, been around all sorts of people. But when I met Brian, it was a certain, ah, uh, man, when you hear him speak, I felt like he, he's such a, such, he, he's much more of a better person than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was, and, and I was like, I got to do better, Mike, shit, you gotta, you gotta do better. Um, but, but he, you know, the way he handles himself, the way that, you know, his strategy, his mind, his uh, dedication. He doesn't fatigue on his journey, on his mission. He uh, continues to um, to 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 uh, beat this drum of justice. He, uh, you know, you know, nowadays we, we have these moments, you know, online where we we, 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 we we emotionally react to certain things. And we, you know, we're, we're a part of the revolution and, 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 and this campaigning for, for whatever cause it is. And then 30 minutes later, we're done. You know, this guy has dedicated his entire life to this cause, you know, and he's, he's standing out front of it. So, so, so for me, I looked at him as like, you know, larger than life, you know, he deals with these real life stakes every day. He would step up, come to set and, um, you know, check things out, make sure I wasn't messing up. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then he would be on the next thing, smoking back to the Supreme Court, fighting cases, you know? So, the, you know, that type of dedication, um, you know, is uh, is very heroic, very superhero esque. What was the Brian said that there were things that you did that were a little bit uncomfortable in taking on this part, and I imagine for Jamie, you too. Talk a little bit about that. I think um, I'm not sure exactly which parts he's talking about, but <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a few. Um, but it's all in service of the work, you know. I think I think Brian's approach to a lot of things is he puts his ego and his pride to the side. There's a lot of uncomfortable situations that he had to be in um, to service his client, you know. Uh, you know, Dylan, you saw some of it in the movie when he had to get you know illegally strip searched, you know, to come into the prison to see one of his clients. Um, I'm sure dealing with judges and prosecutors and you know, sheriffs and, you know, the general public d deep down in the South and, 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 and all over, it was very uncomfortable, you know, for him at times. And, you know, where you would want to emotionally react a certain type of way, you know? I know me, and if I was in those situations, even, in, you know, in shooting the movie, there were times where my natural choices in, in the scene would be emotional or, you know, rage or, you know, anger. But if I went about it that way, I wouldn't be able to get anything done. I wouldn't be able to 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 serve my client the right type of way. So it was it was definitely that restraint um, was something that you know a tone and choice that we wanted to honor and make sure we, we told told that very accurate to, to Brian's life. Um, but yeah, it, it was. Uh, I think sometimes speaking your truth, you know, um, getting close to things that that make you uncomfortable. Um, being in and out of prisons, you know, I've never really spent time in the courthouse before. You know, usually my mind associates courtrooms with, you know, either you're, you're defending yourself, you know, um, something negative. That institution has never been anything good for somebody that looks like me. So to be able to take that space and learn how to use it as a, uh, as a position of power, um, how Brian stands, how he walks, how he uses that geography of a courtroom to his advantage, um, was something that uh, well, was definitely something to get used to, if that answers that. Now, Jamie, you have said that you actually knew Michael since he was tiny. Yeah, when he had the little cornrows and the braid, <laughs> little tank top. So he rocked the hell out of a tank top. <laughs> now the boy, you know, <laughs> killmonger. 
<laughs> that boy is shaking. He showed, and I, I hate to put him on blast, but he showed me a clip of his next movie that's coming out, and he's fighting with his shirt off. <laughs> For a long time, ladies. <laughs> it's over and over again, fighting with his shirt off. But what was crazy, I saw a muscle in his back I've never seen before. <laughs> I said, how you get this, it's another knot. I said, what kind of regiment? Because I got on a spank right now. I'm a... <laughs> I'm hanging out with them, I got to put on my spank. I guess they call them Manx, because it's, I'm a man. <laughs> Uh, well, what was the question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering how you parlayed that relationship where you were sort of the, uh, uh, a, I'm gonna say, a mentor, I'm gonna say as Michael this. described it into this, into this film, where you know, your character doesn't trust him at first. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. First of all, uh, Michael B. Jordan is a stand-up guy. And what I mean by that is, is if you turn my mic up a little bit, because I've got a little bit of a cold. But Michael B. Jordan is a stand-up guy. And what I mean by that is that when we were deciding, when he called me for this, I was humbled and honored uh, to be in the talk with him. Um, we had our personal conversation about it. And, and basically, I would not give him everything away. He gave me an opportunity to get my, uh, my artistic integrity intact or back. Uh, and that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen a lot in, in, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, and then introducing me to Brian Stevenson, who is the most important person in the world right now. Uh, and he has been for a long time. It's serious. And, and if we could turn this up just a little bit, but if, and it's up to us to make sure that everybody gets out to see this movie, not just because we want it to be successful, but because of the message that what he talks about is what we're on our phones talking about all the time, and we don't necessarily know where to go. He could tell you where to go. And so that's why this is important. And I would say this in talking to Michael B. Jordan, you know what's great about him beyond what I was saying, the aesthetics of him, because he is a good looking guy. <laughs> but what's, what, what I think is amazing in his star, as, as big a star as he is, he does a movie like this. And if you think about it, when he laid down the railroad tracks, the DNA of Fruitville Station. <laughs> to, to me, as I say, that, that is so, that was big. And when we went to that movie, I took guys with me that were like, you know, hardened, you know, I know some thugs, like guys that don't cry type guys. And there was a point in that movie where I heard, <laughs> I heard people weeping because of his performance. But then he goes on to Black Panther. And, the, and this is the biggest movie in the world, and he plays the villain, but at that same time, that narrative of caring about us, about our culture, is put on the biggest stage in the world. And now he takes Just Mercy, this wonderful man's story, and he is, he's finishing an artistic, artistic sentence. This won't be the last sentence he writes, but it's, it's a beautiful thing that he comes back, he's mindful of, what we need, and at the highest point, most people will go off and do whatever movie it is, but to do this, I think it's, it's amazing. And I gotta say this, behind the camera, producer, um, in front of the camera, incredible actor, he, he did a scene, the scene in the courtroom, which I thought was so important. Those words are so important. And uh, he, he was working on that scene. When we were in that, when we were in that scene, he, 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 he wanted to get it right so bad, he flubbed a couple of lines. He said, oh, my, my bad, bro, bro. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, bro, bro. And he, a couple of times, he, he, you know, he flubbed, and I pulled him to the side and said, hey, listen, this is your movie. We're here for you. If it takes you 30 minutes to say one line, you take that time. we all here for you, and we're here for him. And he came out. He laid it out, and he got a standing ovation in the courtroom from the extras. <laughs> but he didn't get a chance to see it, because he was so caught up, all of the work that he had put in, along with the performance, he was so caught up, and I went to, 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 to touch his arm and say, good job, and he, he, and he, walked, he walked out. I was like, uh-oh. And you know, he had, you know, we, black people call it the Holy Spirit. 
And I was like, that boy got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, you hold yourself. And I texted him, I said, listen, all the hard work paid off. I texted him while he was outside. What you just did, standing ovation from this audience, from these extras that were all in sync with you. And then finally going to TIFF, Toronto Film Festival, which is big. This is big. And I told him, I said, you're going to be surprised when the world gets a chance to see this. And when he walked out, they gave him a standing ovation. And he finally got to see it. <laughs> I mean, he, uh, Jamie's a big brother, man. He's, uh, he, he's always been the, you know, outside of work, always encouraging me, always giving me mentor, mentorship and, and advice. And, uh, you know, when it comes to, to acting, you know, he's, to me, one of the goats. He's on the Mount Rushmore. You know, he is, uh, he's incredible. And... And I've always grew up watching him. I, I've, I've learned from him so much from him. And, uh, you know, that, that's an example of, of me, you know, this is a family movie. Everybody involved really cared about this project. Uh, uh, all the actors, you know, the crew, um, the producers, the studio, everybody supported one another because of, of this man, Brian Stevenson, because of his vision, because of how important the story is. And, um, and, and that was just one example of, of, you know, me being in a place of, you know, actors, we, we circle certain scenes in a script, you know, we, 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 we clock it. Okay, cool. I can't wait to do that. Or that's something I'm looking forward to doing. I don't want to mess it up. It's a, it's a pivotal moment in the movie. You know, it's, it's, it's a pivotal moment in Walter's case. Uh, I got, I got to get it right. And I wanted to get it right so bad that uh, I was like really, really anxious about it. And he was able to really, you know, he, he, he calmed me down and I wouldn't. I don't know what I would do without uh, without Jamie on this project, so it was good. Brian, Brian, you're you're a producer on the movie as well, and you were. It sounds like you were on set sometimes. Were there moments that you wanted to be on set for that Michael did or didn't want you there, or anybody? You know, were there things that you needed to see? No, I I completely trusted uh, Michael. I completely trusted the entire cast. They were so locked in. They were so engaged. You know, Michael came to Montgomery. We spent a lot of time together. And, uh, you know, we've opened this new museum that's dedicated to the history of slavery in America. Um, and we have the memorial. And we spent a lot of time in those spaces just talking about the weight of this history that gave rise to this. Because, you know, we got into this situation. Walter McMillan was convicted. Uh, because of the politics of fear and anger. We've allowed our politicians to govern through fear and anger. That's what's given rise to mass incarceration. We said that people who are drug addicted and drug dependent are criminals, and we need the criminal justice system to respond. We should have said they have a health need, and we need the health care system to respond. Um, and, and, and you know, one of the reasons why I wrote the book, I mean, I spent the first 20 years of my career in the court. I, I was undercover. I didn't want people to know what I was doing. I felt like to get people out of prison, to get people off death row, it was like operating the Underground Railroad. If you do too much attention, there'd be all of these things coming at you. And then I realized about 10 years ago that if we don't change the environment outside the courtroom, we're not going to get the kind of justice we need. And that's what made me feel like we've got to start talking more publicly. And um, you know, everybody in the cast seemed to understand that. And when Michael came to Montgomery, you know, we talked about this history. You know, we're not free in this country. We're burdened by our history of racial injustice. There's a smog in the air created by decades and centuries of racial inequality. We're a post-genocide society. We haven't talked about what happened to Native people when Europeans came to this continent. Um, you know, the, the, the legacy of slavery created this consciousness, this ideology of white supremacy that we never really confronted you know, we, we passed the 13th Amendment that talks about ending involuntary servitude, but it doesn't say anything about ending this narrative of racial difference, this ideology of white supremacy. And because of that, I don't think slavery ended in 1865. I think it just evolved. It turned into decades uh, of, of terrorism and violence, and all of us were impacted by that. You know, black people were forced from the American South through th terror and threats. And, and today, even, we're still dealing with it. There's a presumption of dangerousness and guilt 
that is assigned to black and brown people. That's what Michael was portraying when he, talked to, when he performed at Fruit Field Station. Jamie has lived it, and we all understand it. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to expose these problems in a really, really uh, powerful way. And so his commitment and the entire cast's commitment made me feel like, you know, I didn't have to be there. Uh, you know, I, I worked a lot with Destin on the script, and that was important to me to get the frame right. Uh, but these are such talented human beings, such gifted human beings. I didn't have many concerns that they would bring it to light. And uh, I, I was not disappointed. I'm, I'm really proud of this movie. Yeah. We, we, I want to talk a little bit. We talked about about Michael's origin in film uh, with Fruitvale, and I, I'm curious, Brian, for your origins. I mean, as a person who grew up as you did, knowing what you know, why did you think the law would be the right place for you? Why did you trust that you could perhaps make a difference there? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a product of Brown versus Board of Education. I grew up in a community where black children couldn't go to the public schools. Um, there were no high schools for black kids when my dad was a teenager, and my dad was smart. My dad was hardworking, but he couldn't get a high school degree. And I remember when lawyers came into the community and made them open up the public schools. And because those lawyers got proximate to poor black kids like me, I got to go to high school, I got to go to college. Um, I, I was a philosophy major in college, and toward the end of my college career, somebody came up to me one day and said, you know, nobody's gonna pay you to philosophize when you graduate. <laughs> And so I started trying to get into some graduate program and I landed up, uh, landed in law school. And when I went to Harvard Law School, I'd never met a lawyer. Uh, but when I was there, I had the opportunity to, to go to Atlanta, Georgia. And when I met people on death row, literally dying for legal assistance, everything changed for me. And for the last 35 years, I've been trying to use the law uh, to protect people who are disfavored. Because the thing we need to remember about our efforts at ending bigotry and discrimination, democracy failed. If you had a vote to end racial segregation in my community, the vote would have gone against black people. It took a commitment to the rule of law, it took that right. And I wanted to use that power on behalf of disfavored people. We couldn't have gotten Walter McMillan off death row if it was up to the county to vote. We wouldn't be able to do some of the things we've done. Uh, and so I'm still committed to the rule of law. But about 10 years ago, I realized something that terrified me. And what I realized is that I don't think we could win Brown versus Board of Education today. I don't think our courts are committed to protecting disfavored people if it means disrupting uh, these systems of power and status. Uh, my friend Sherilyn Eiffel is here, the head of the LD, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Yes. Um, and, um, She's written about how some of our new federal judges who are being nominated refuse to, uh, to, to acknowledge that Brown versus Board of Education is law that should be defended. They won't, even in the nomination process, uh, defend it. And that scared me. And that's when I realized I have to get out of the court. We've got to start talking about these issues. We've got to create a consciousness about this. We've got to warn people that if we allow ourselves to be governed by fear and anger, we will tolerate things we should never tolerate. We'll accept things we should never accept. Fear and anger are the essential ingredients of injustice and oppression. And you go anywhere in the world where there's been abuse of rights, the abusers will give you a narrative of fear and anger. It's what created the Holocaust. It's what led to the genocide in Rwanda. It's what sustained so much of the bigotry. And we are at risk if we don't recognize the threat that that poses. And so for me, getting out there and talking about these issues has become a priority because we need a new era of truth and justice in this country. We do. Um, and um, I, I, I'm talking more and more about history because I don't think we know where we, how we got here. And until we understand that better, uh, and sometimes people hear me talking about, you know, the, the legacy of slavery and lynching and segregation, and I think they think I want to punish America for this history. I have no interest in punishment. 
My interest is liberation. I just believe there is something that feels more like freedom, more like equality, more like justice than what we have yet experienced in this nation. But to get there, we're going to have to stand up, as we say in the film, even when people say sit down, we're going to have to speak. Even when people say be quiet, we're going to have to vote. We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to recognize that we are not finished yet with this goal of equality and justice. And that's what I hope this movie inspires people to recognize, is that we have more power than we sometimes acknowledge. And it's our hopefulness that will get us there, you know? And I, I just can't believe sometimes, I'm sitting on a stage with some of these amazing people. They're so incredibly talented. Uh, oh, man, hey, man, you amazing. <laughs> uh, you amazing. Brian Stevenson, 2020. <laughs> Brian Stevenson, 20. Uh, on, the, on the point of you know one person standing up to institutions, uh, I should mention that this is the first film that Warner Brothers has made with an inclusion writer, uh, which means that it gave the, the, the studio gave more opportunities to women, people of color, other underprivileged groups, and that was Michael's doing. Uh, Michael, can you talk a little bit about that effort? Following Frances McDormand's, uh, hello, who's on? Okay, cool. All right, Frances McDormand's uh, uh, Oscar speech where she mentioned the inclusion writer. I was in the audience that day, and um, you know, I didn't know there was something actually official, something on paper that you could, uh, you know, um, actually implement. You know, uh, I would have honestly naturally done it anyway in the sense of hiring the people that look like me, uh, that, that you know, that didn't get opportunities. I, I want my company ran um, by people by the world that, uh, that I actually live in. I wanted it to look like the world that I actually live in. Um, but once I, I saw that there was an occlusion writer, um, I made it my uh, production company's um, policy. Uh, Warner Brothers ran towards that idea. Um, I applaud them for that. Uh, so much that Warner Media um, uh, asked us to help write their um, inclusion uh, uh, mandate for, for their company. So now all of Warner Media hires. Uh, under that policy, and um, and Just Mercy was the first movie, like you said. So just you know, imagine a, a crew of people who have been in the industry, you know, thirty plus years, uh, that never had an opportunity to be a, a head of the department, um, and now this was their opportunity, and and just to see them with that pride, see them with that. Um, that sense of uh, accomplishment that they could take on from to project to project. And it's not bulletproof, you know, but I feel like it sets a precedent across the board that hopefully other production companies and other studios would, would, would follow suit. And, um, and yeah, man, sometimes it's just getting that foot in the door, getting an opportunity, getting a chance to be seen. Um, this industry is very clicky, you know, it's very, you know, we hired people that we know, our friends, you know, we, it becomes a, a circle. It's very um, grouping in that type of way. So to be able to open that up to other talented people who just need an opportunity, um, especially uh, underrepresented groups, um, black and brown people, especially, um, and women as well, that, that we'll be able to, you know, start seeing some change. We got a long, long road to go, but I think it's the first step and um, something that I was proud of. Michael V. Jordan, 2020. <laughs> Could you imagine? Nah, nah, nah. That would be, hey, 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 hey. Uh, there's a few people about to run that I don't know. <laughs> Before we nominate you for campaign manager, Jamie, I did want to ask you uh, about uh, a little bit about how you get into character. I understand that you use music as a tool, uh, kind of even different, queuing up different songs for different scenes. Is that right? Well, I think what was important on the, on this film is that we had to we had to sort of set the tone, I believe, and and so being me being from the south and um, and and knowing that we were going to have to go places. Uh, in this film that, that you can see are going to be, you know, gut-wrenching. So, you know, we would play music, um, um, you know, whether it's Fred Hammond, whether it's, um, uh, you know, T Tamla Mann, you know, just to, you know, n no weapon formed against me was definitely um, a way to sort of set our minds. Because when you hear... Uh, you know, one of my favorites, who is you know Fred Hammond, singing that. 
um, it puts you in uh, the right mindset. And because it's tough, and, uh, and that's why I, I continuously ap ap applaud Mr. Stevenson, because it's tough. Because I had a, a my, you talked about being uncomfortable. Me being in jail, going to the jail cell is uncomfortable. And that was a situation that I don't speak about a lot, but even when they were putting the cuffs on me and they had the actor there, but they had the, the, the real guy uh, telling him what to do with the cuffs. And at one point, just as I'm about to go in, he leans over to the guy and says, put, put them on tighter because he's, he's one of the bigger ones. Now, he didn't mean anything by it. It's protocol for him. But for me... You know, that's, you know, you're like, wow, that's, that's weird. And also the fact that my father, uh, they put him in jail for $25 worth of illegal substance. They gave him seven years. So you got to understand that this man, my father taught black history in school in the hood for 25 years. The very judge that he would have come and mentor the kids presided over his case. Put him in jail next to the kids that he taught. But they not understanding that my father taught me everything. Taught me how to throw a football. My father taught me how to play tennis. I said, why am I playing tennis? He said, because I want you to know it all. Swim, play tennis, what white people do. I said, why? <laughs> but that man now sits in a jail cell. They didn't understand how much he meant to me and his family, like Walter McMillan, to his family. So I don't visit people in jail because I, I don't want that imagery. I've never seen anybody. I wrote my father one letter. I said, you get out, you come stay with me. I got on. I, ma I made it. You come stay with me. And when he got out, you know, I got a chance to take him to the U.S. Open because he loved tennis so much. And we sat there and watched Venus play. You know? But not everybody has myself, Walter McMillan, or Michael B. Jordan to do that. So it's, it was the music, it was the, 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 the everything that, that went along uh, with getting this done. You know, when, when the when the story starts, when the movie starts, there's a certain naivete to the character of Brian. And I'm wondering, was that accurate and was it necessary? Well, I, I do think it was uh, necessary because whatever you think you know about how bad our system is, it's worse. You know, I, I had a sense that we had this system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent, but I didn't fully appreciate how it, impossible it becomes for the poor uh, to overcome these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt. And I always assumed that if I have this piece of evidence and that piece of evidence, if I can conclusively establish that my client is innocent, I will prevail. And I kept running into these schemes where that didn't happen. You know, Walt, uh, Anthony Ray Hinton, who's played by O'Shea Jackson in the film, you know, he was on death row before Walter McMillan, and I didn't get involved in his case until 1999. It took us 16 years with overwhelming evidence of his innocence before we were able to win his freedom, that scene where he walks out during the credits. That was just four years ago. And um, so, yes, I do think it's um, necessary that you go into this work with, a, with an awareness that the forces that are, are aligned against you are even more uh, committed to the status quo. And then we have these other forces out there. I mean, you know, we've got now private prisons where people have an economic incentive to keep people in jails and prisons. Uh, we don't have uh, accountability. Our prosecutors and our police and our judges have immunity, which means that if they do something really misguided, like they did here, we sued the sheriff for putting Mr. McMillan on death row for 15 months pre-trial, clearly illegal. And the court said, you can't sue the sheriff because the sheriff has immunity as a state officer. 
And that kind of immunity insulates uh, us from the kind of reform that we need to have. So yeah, I do think it was necessary to show this growth. And I'm still learning. Look, again, 20, in my first 20 years, I didn't want to talk to anybody outside the court. I was trying to keep my head down. And now I feel like we've got to get out there. We've got to do things like tell these stories. So it's still a journey for me. And uh, you know, uh, when we decided to build this museum and, and this memorial, uh, people said, you don't know nothing about building a museum. Why are you going to do that? And you, know, you just have to have this hope. And uh, I, I've always been hopeful. I, I will say that was true for me. And that was just given to me by my people. You know, my great grandfather was enslaved in Caroline County, Virginia, learned to read as an enslaved person because he had this hope of freedom. And when he got out, he would read to all of the other formerly enslaved people because he knew how to read. Everybody would come to his house, and each night he would stand up there and read the newspaper. And my grandmother would sit next to him, and she loved the power that his reading uh, evoked. And she said, I want to learn to read, too. And even though she didn't have a formal education, she was unbelievably literate. And she gave that to my mother. And my mother gave that to me. We grew up poor in a racially segregated community, but my mom went into debt to buy the World Book Encyclopedia so we'd have a portal to the world. And I don't forget that when I'm doing the work that I'm doing. These were people who had enough hope to love one another and create another generation despite the cruelty of slavery, the terror of lynching, the bigotry of segregation. And so when you're kind of fueled by that, yeah, it's a journey, and you learn things, and you keep learning things. And the most remarkable thing you know, my clients have taught me is that just because someone condemns you, just because someone says your life has no meaning or purpose or value doesn't make it true. And if you hold on to your dignity and you hold on to your hope, uh, there is this possibility for redemption and restoration. And that's what sustained Walter McMillan. That's what sustained Anthony Ray Hinton. I couldn't get them out if they didn't hold on, if they didn't fight if they didn't care. And that's the beautiful thing uh, that I get to see uh, doing the work that I do. And I just hope this film encourages more people to hold on and to fight and to care, because that's what it's going to take uh, to, to really turn this thing around. But to, yeah, I think it was important that you see that arc. It's what you, you know, see in my book. And, and I hope people will also read the book, because we left a lot out uh, of the movie that's in the book. Uh, and I hope people will kind of uh, take that step, too. Wait. We, we are already over time, so I just want to, we, we guys, we snuck in a little extra time with these folks, but I, I want to end on, on that thought of, of hope. And uh, Michael and Jamie, maybe you can talk about how, you know, being around Brian has expanded, I w as I would imagine, your sense of hope. I mean, I think, I think um, honestly, just being around him uh, made me a much better person, uh, knowledgeable, aware, um, I think being frustrated for you know a lot of my life, when I had the consciousness of wanting to make a difference or try to be a part of the solution and not knowing how, um, having this energy bottled up but didn't really see an avenue to really um, like what would really make a you know an impact not just for the moment but for the for the long haul and <clears throat> I think he's given me that you know. Uh, that outlet, you know, along with obvious, you know, storytelling, which I think is very powerful, you know, to provoke thought and inspire conversation and get, you know, hide the medicine and the food, you know, um, I think that's uh, a real powerful way to get things across. But um, also just, yeah, man, he's inspired me across the board. And I think it doesn't just stop with this press tour or after the movie, it's something that, uh, you know, it's a lifestyle now and it's something that, uh, that won't stop. I, listen, I mean, I think we've, we've said a lot here, but I will say this, we really need you. We need you to go tell everybody about this film because this is the most important film we're gonna have, nothing against anybody else's film. <laughs> but you think about what you see, what you heard up here. It, it's, it's like the film is the extension of Brian Stevenson. It is also the the the, the cinematic legacy of this young man, uh, Michael B. Jordan, who I will continue to tell you, it is so tough to do any movie in Hollywood, 
but to do these types of movies, he's doing it for you. And I'm gonna give you this. It's a human story. They were so eloquent in how they crafted this movie that it didn't go off of a black cliff, meaning like only black people could get it. They were conscious of that. Because if you watch the film, what I thought was brilliant with our director, Michael B, is when you saw the white character, the correctional officer who had contrition. Now, if you are white and you feel that way, now you're in, now you are in it. You see yourself in that. Even with the prosecuting attorney, you see the contrition on his face. So I think that was brilliant. You know why? Because the nuts and bolts of the movie is that it tested in front of an all black audience at a 97. We, well, we hoped that was going to happen, <laughs> right? Will you come through, right? Come through. <laughs> then they tested it in front of an all-white audience in the Midwest. And I said, oh, man, what they say. <laughs> it tested at a 98. <laughs> so everybody says, what can you do? Or what can we do after this? The first thing you can do is get on any platform you have, get on your social media if you're young, if you're older. <laughs> Call your landline, get on your landline. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever you gotta do to get it out, just mercy. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. You've been a great audience. Thank you to our guests. Vote Stevenson and Michael B. Jordan 2020. <laughs>